is now doing lots of technical work. I am also a hybrid um, a person, right? We, we have uh, a lot of different skills across us. And so that makes it fun because uh, privacy requires a little bit of everything. Privacy Rates Clearinghouse is a small nonprofit. Uh, if you're trying to place it, this had been uh, Beth Givens had uh, started this. It's over 30 years old. Uh, Megan Land is our executive director, has been for the last five years. Uh, it is a group that punches way above its weight. Megan and Emery are why. Uh, and I'm on the board of directors for it, which is how I factor in as well. Um, just a tremendous uh, small nonprofit able to do a lot of really interesting work. So why do we as a community, why does was why does PRC care about data breaches in particular? Um, well, here you have a, a data model in the US of kind of um, collect all the things with no data minimization requirements maybe sell all the things or share all the things, but then lose all the things. And so data are lost regularly. Uh, and what data breach notification does is at least let people know what data of theirs has now gone out into the wild. Uh, and it lets them be able to respond. So another thing I really want to highlight here is that even if two different people have the same sorts of data collected, the release of that data can affect them very disproportionately. Uh, if you are a victim of domestic abuse, having your address get out is very different, right? So depending on where you're situated is how much of a problem this is for you. And we'll look at this a little bit more for the data set exercises we're coming up. Um, and we have this problem once the data get out, there's really no putting that toothpaste back in the tube. So there have been a couple of different approaches to this problem of we have data breaches, now what? Uh, one is a kind of pets approach, right? This fabulous uh, website, Have I Been Pwned? It looks for specific things for you, your email address, your phone number, go see, is that up somewhere on the dark web? Is that somewhere the, the folks running this website can find it? If so, you know you have a problem. Um, so that's a, a kind of comfortable, familiar sort of approach. Uh, we don't have a, a whole lot from the other side of there's there's been a breach. Now, what can we do with that from a pet's perspective, which is part of why we're excited here today to hear some of your thoughts about what you would like to do with this, perhaps. Um, another way that we can kind of get a handle, get our arms around this data breach problem, the scale of it, is that we have journalism still. And so we hear from reporters around this. Uh, but the place where we've lived uh, from PRC is relying, lately in particular, relying on government disclosure. Uh, it's an open data approach. So to just do quick highlights on some of the legislation, since 2005, when the state of California passed the first data breach notification law through 2018, in the U.S. we now have 100% of states have some type of data breach notification law. Um, at the federal level, we have a medical requirement for data breach, but we don't have anything that is comprehensive and we don't have standards across these, right? Each law is a little bit different from the rest. Um, GDPR does require data breach notification, but it might or might not be required to go to the individual level. So then we have the question of, well, okay, we have a data breach notification. Great, our data is out there. What does that letter look like? What does that notice look like? Just like privacy policies, it's not standardized. Big blobs of text, good luck. Um, and just like privacy policies, it's often not very readable. Um, and sometimes in the U.S., state statutes require, for example, perhaps the state AG's office to share the uh, data breach notification notices that they receive, but sometimes not. Here is an example of what this might look like. So this is the Capital One data breach, um, and I know you can't read this. Um, the highlight here is of things that are 
you know, fairly standard, like, uh, uh, what happened, what you can do. Notice the what you can do is two lines, and it basically comes down to credit monitoring. Uh, and this is pages one through three of 22 pages. Again, like privacy policies, no one wants to read these, and most people don't. Funny how that works. So we have some challenges to using these government sources of open data. Um, first of all, we don't have coverage over the entire country, let alone globally. Uh, secondly, because these structures are changing, it's not like there's an API we can go to and have the state of California provide data. Instead, this is scraping their website, right? That level, and then trying to process these blobs of text. Um, for humans, this is really hard in legal language. It's also really hard trying to train interns to understand what they're seeing, which has until recently been our source of trying to go through these. Um, and then also the scale here is amazing. So if we think about 2019, let's imagine a US work week, eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, no vacations, 52 weeks a year, right? Uh, so we're looking at having a new notice come in um, about every three and a half minutes. So staffing up to be able to do that, to be able to get through 23 pages, having that level to handle the scale is really hard. So PRC has been working on this data breach chronology to raise these issues, to get transparency, to provide data uh, for a long time. And data brokers have been a big issue that PRC has focused on for a long time, and they're very involved in this as well. So we have a dashboard. Everybody needs a dashboard. This is useful for researchers. Perhaps your next pet's paper starts today. Uh, this is useful for people who are designing and creating pets. We would love to see those in the world. Also to drive change, uh, create the ability to get knowledge out there support community organizations, and directly to consumers who come to the website. So these are our constituents. We had been coding everything effectively by hand. We work with a lot of academic groups, um, thanks to the Coleman Research Lab for helping us as we're normalizing the data to try to get it into some sort of shape that's queryable. Um, since then, GPT has really come a long way and Emery's done amazing things getting it to dance. So we now have moved to having AI not just classifying data, but normalizing and extracting the data as well. And being able to do that is amazingly powerful. We have the same AI concerns everyone else has. We do at least have the ability to contrast how things are coded by humans to how things are coded by GPT to be able to see that we have a good match and that we have good data. Um, we do look at this as an AI for good project. We're able to use these tools to surface some of the issues that we never would have been able to keep up with otherwise. And as a reminder on that scale, we have something across 18 years with 20,000 breaches affecting 2 billion records. So I wanna put my, my board of directors hat on for just a moment and also raise the issue of financial sustainability for this. It's not a company, this isn't a product, we're not trying to be profitable and we're gonna IP it, no. But uh, we do have the twin goals of trying to get this data out into the world, actionable, frictionless, but also keep the lights on and have hosting costs and have real ongoing costs in addition to staff costs. Uh, so we found out that some major companies you've heard of were using our data set in ways that they were profiting from, as companies do, uh, when at one point access dropped off. We had a, a technical issue and started getting phone calls from people. Where are the data? So that was interesting to learn. Um, and so we have this balance. So what we're doing is a little similar to what pets and other conferences do, where we have people who have, you know, for conferences, they have funding to be able to come to the conference and that makes the conference go. 
and for students and for those who are not able to fund directly, PETS is able to help with waiving those costs and in PETS case, even defraying some of them. Thank you to PETS. Um, so we can't defray costs, but we can waive them. If there are students who are taking a class and they're working on this one-on-one, -on -one, sure, we're gonna support them. If you as a researcher have an NSF grant, we would ask you to please write us in as a budget line. We're very, very small. And if you want to apply together, we're really good at helping to be broader impacts and tech transfer and love those projects too. Please keep us in mind. Um, so that's how we've tried to, to do both of these at once. And from here, we're gonna move to the interesting part and I'll get out of Emery's way and he'll tell you about the exercise he's about to lead. Thank you so much, Alicia, for the introduction and the background on the work that we've done so far. I am excited to walk you through this exercise, and I know that I've gotten to talk to a lot of you folks this week over drinks and meals and, frankly, taking up probably too much of your time in between the sessions, talking about the challenges that we are facing with this project and the current approaches that we're doing. But this exercise, and I hope everyone has a handout or at least has a friend nearby that they can share one with, I apologize. You guys showed up far more than I thought you would. Uh, it is early on a Friday. I, I assumed I would only need a fewer handouts. But this is a group exercise. Uh, for our folks that are online uh, streaming remotely, I don't think breakout rooms are possible, but please do breakout rooms. Um, handle this in the chat. Uh, you can do this solo or you can do this together with the group. Uh, but, and it has been about seven seconds since I said form up into groups and nothing has happened. Time is not on our side, so I'm going to try to group you guys together based on sort of proximity where you guys are. Um, so perhaps uh, you group can come together here, you group can come together here. This is a group exercise. Uh, we're we're going to look for, we're going to try to form somewhere around eight or tw you know, so groups, but it's not that important about how many groups we form. Uh, try to cluster together, you know, about maybe two rows each, right? Perfect. Uh, the groups, I should have said that. Um, I was thinking the groups would just be the two rows, and so the size of the group doesn't matter, but let's try to form no more than like 10 groups. Perfect, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Wonderful, and everyone has a handout and is beginning to work. This is excellent because if you wait for me to stop talking before you begin your work, nothing will get done. And so, uh, if you've read the handout, you can tell that this is an exercise that is going to give you firsthand experience doing the same challenges and pitfalls that we go through trying to track U.S. data breaches using an open data approach. The purpose of this assignment is to highlight the ways that the lack of a standardized data breach notification law, the disparity of information across these data sources, makes this challenge really difficult. So I'm going to ask everyone to uh, try to find someone in your group that has a mobile device. I'm sure you all have that. Uh, or a laptop, uh, and go to our website at privacyrights.org slash data hyphen breaches. Uh, folks online can do the same, please do. Uh, that's our data breach chronology. It is um, mobile friendly and only slightly janky. Small nonprofit means that we all get to be experts and I am the Tableau expert in our organization. So uh, on the back of the handout and on the PDF, Sure, uh, I'm gonna ask everyone to be uh, maybe a little bit quieter, please. Thank you so much. And I'm going to try to uh, speak a little clearer into the microphone. I hope that's helpful. Now the back of the handout has screenshots as well as the uh, PDF that is posted in the uh, Zulip that should uh, provide some information about the various dashboards that we have. Uh, there are a number of dashboard views uh, that you can use on our chronology, uh, but for this exercise, let's try to stick just to the key insights and the search data breach view. Um, wonderful. Does everyone have uh, someone? Apologies. Um, I'm going to hold on to this, but I'll hand this off to you when I get the chance. Uh, but yes, for uh, the folks that do not have a handout, look over your friend's shoulder. Um, <laughs> and time is of the essence. So. Uh, I'm going to ask that also someone in the group try to assign themselves to be the scribe for the group. Uh, you are going to be tasked with recording the insights and inferences that your group can come up with, but the assignment, <laughs> nose goes works, uh, absolutely. Um, 
we are going to try to look into one particularly impactful data breach from 2019. This is the Capital One data breach. It resulted in the exposure of absolutely gobs and gobs of people's sensitive personal financial information, which, as Alicia mentioned earlier, can be especially impactful to people uh, depending on, uh, <laughs> obviously. So, there is a sources filter on our data breach chronology that allows you to filter down between the individual data sources. Now that you've formed up groups, I'm going to ask that each group pick a single data source uh, to begin this study. The challenge here is to try to find as much information as you can using the single data breach source, and then we're going to switch sources and compare and see what information is unavailable, what information is different, uh, and uh, try to think about why that might be. So, for folks, um, I was going to try to assign the states, but you know what? That is not going to be possible. Here you go. So as you are looking at this data breach in our chronology, here are some guiding questions that you might want to consider. Try to figure out how many records were exposed. Is that information that is being provided by the data breach source, or is it buried in the data breach notification letter? Is it available at all? If you're looking at our chronology, um, a little bit of information about the data points that you're going to see. The name of the breached organization, the date field, the description field, these are all information that we try to pull from the nice, from, from the tables, I shouldn't say nice, from the tables that the various OAGs provide on their website. This is all scraped and smashed together, uh, and uh, it is difficult because these state sources are not consistent, uh, the staffers are not consistent, the websites break and go down often. The breach types and the uh, organization types are, and the location field is some of the information that we use AI to help with. Now you only have a few minutes left in this part of the exercise. Are you feeling the pressure? I hope all of you have had the opportunity to read the data breach notification letter, all 22 pages of each of them that are posted. Now, if you have any questions as we're going about this, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I will try to jump over and uh, answer your question, repeat it for the rest of the class. Uh, one of the things that I find really interesting that Alicia mentioned earlier is the, uh, the concerns that we have around AI. If you're looking at the classifications for breach types and organization types uh, and the location information, these are fields that we actually use AI to help extract relevant information from. The challenges with confabulation, with um, making stuff up, stuff that appears correct but that isn't, we are all familiar with with AI. But we are able to additionally get uh, ex explanation information for each of the breach determinations as well, which can help with checking on the AI determinations. Ah. The, uh, the two views that are going to be most useful for this exercise are the key insights and the search breaches view. You can find information about what those buttons do on the back of your handout. Something that is not on the handout that may be useful is once you get to the search breaches field and find an individual breach, you can click on more information to pull up information from that specific breach. If you want to get back to the search view without having to redo all of your filters, Click on the Search Breaches tab again. And, okay, everyone stop and stop talking. Shh. Now. You've had only a few minutes to look up the breach on one particular data source. I'm sure all of you feel like you understand exactly what happened and all the information that was exposed. Let's now look at another breach source. We're going to look at the same exact breach, but from a different data source. So 
take that filter box where it says data sources and change it from California to Montana, from Indiana to New Jersey, from Wisconsin to whatever. I don't know all the, breach, all the state sources. Uh, use the bulleted list on the handout if you can, uh, because those I know at least all include Capital One's data breach. You're going to one more question. That's absolutely the point. <laughs> the question was, is it realistic to do all of this in the time given? Yes. Uh, no, it is not realistic. Um, but the point is often to uh, illustrate both the challenge in extracting this information in a short amount of time, given the flood of data breaches that we're dealing with, and also to recognize the disparity of information across these data sources. And I apologize for folks using mobile. I have to admit that it's not as convenient as the, the full desktop environment. Five minute warning. So now that you've switched data sources, let's try to see if you can recognize information that's different, information that's not being shared in the same way, uh, information that conflicts with the first data source. I encourage you all to think about not just what is different, but potentially why is it different? Why perhaps are there multiple data breach entries for a single breach across the different sources or in the same source? Are these duplicate entries? Potentially, certainly. Or it could be a single breach that has received uh, an updated piece of information. California, I know, for example, has a wonderful letter from 2021, which uh, unfortunately reveals that the data breach also includes social security information. No spoilers. <laughs> All right. I apologize for putting you all under the pressure. I know this is not nearly enough time, and you are all fascinated by all of the data that we have at your fingertips. But I am going to ask you to try to think of some inferences, a 30-second point, a question, or something to share, because in about 35 seconds, I'm going to start going around the room and seeing if we can talk about what happened. Two minutes, it is time to share some inferences. Let's get some rapid fire responses. We're gonna go ahead and go group to group. Uh, does anyone have a question, a comment, a thought, an inference that they wanna share starting with group number one? Shove the microphone in their face, make them say something. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask found... everyone else to please take it down a notch. Thank you. We found a few different um, sources for a data breach that occurred in March 2019, and all of those seem to say no information available for the number of records affected. Yes, uh, they found, do. We found another from the state of New Jersey um, in August, or yeah, August, and um, that one had a number. It said approximately 100 million people were affected. Right. And it also says the source of the breach was a, uh, some data made available publicly on GitHub. Yes, so yeah, a couple, we're going to reduce this to one point each, and I'm only going to be able to address the first one, the lack of information on the records available in, that were impacted. I think a lot of people here would be surprised to learn that most data breach notification laws do not require that the business report this precise number of records that were impacted in the breach which seems like it would be super important to know about the size of the breach. The handful of states, the very few number of states that do require breach impact numbers to be shared, usually restrict that information to the number of records of the residents of that state that were impacted. Again, making it very, very difficult for folks like us to track the total impacted. New Jersey, I believe, is one of the states that does require the breach number to be inclusive of all residents. but. Uh, the number from the GitHub article, uh, fr from the article of, uh, on GitHub, um, was, uh, yeah, about 100 million records from this breach. Next group, who else wants to say something? 
Um, yeah, so I was browsing through um, the Montana bridge, the, the Montana space for Capital One Bridge, and it seemed that the notification is no longer available. Yes. And when I go to the dogmt.gov, it says that I've been blocked. Yeah, so <laughs> two wonderful problems. For one, state websites in the United States still often do not want to do their GDPR compliance, which makes things difficult for folks like me and all of us that live in Europe. It is uh, ridiculous and they should be shamed for that. The second point that you brought up, that there are dead links, absolutely. The uh, One of the challenges that we frequently run into, which is um, in the next version of the database, we'll be accommodating, uh, will be because we have actually scraped all the PDFs and have the actual PDFs, but we wanted to link to the original sources because that seems better, right? Except these states often take down old breaches. The HHS, the single source of uh, federal data breaches for medical breaches, has recently taken down every single breach before 2019. That's a problem. Uh, Maryland also did something similar. Vermont's links have been broken for six months and they won't respond to my emails. This is another major problem with the open data approach. What else we got? I think we have time for one more question, one more comment while they're dealing with AV stuff. Perfect. You know, I don't have a, a complete comprehensive knowledge base of all of the data breaches in my head. Um, I know, I'm really struggling. I'm up to like 17,000, but it must mean those last 3,000. Um, yeah, that is a good point. Um, the, the question of why is an X major breach here? Um, yeah, the definition of data breach uh, can vary. It is, you know, these are breaches that were being required to be notified uh, based on the data breach notification laws of the state. And infuriatingly, um, there are some major breaches that are classified as breaches. The Cambridge Analytica breach, for example, uh, generally doesn't qu like qualify as a state data breach under the uh, state statutes. But um, it's also possible that we're missing them. You know, this is a, I like to say that this is a database of data breach notifications. It is absolutely not a database comprehensive of all the data breaches that have occurred. Um, I like to say also that, you know, this is a challenge that is trying to use a technological solution to a legislative problem. We are trying to put together the puzzle without, like, comprehensively knowing that we're missing a majority of the puzzle pieces, knowing that we don't have a picture on the front of the box. So even if we had you know, a complete uh, federal comprehensive data breach notification law, we're still only going to be looking at a, a piece of the total data breach landscape. And now uh, I think that the rest of the group is just about ready. I want to wrap this up and thank all of you for the experience of getting to present to you, getting the experience to meet and talk to each of you this week, especially my D&D players. Big hand for the D&D players that joined this week. Um, and uh, a huger hand, please do applaud for Alicia McDonald, my lovely co-presenter. She is the reason why I came here this year. And she is presenting at 3 in the morning right now. So uh, with that, uh, if you have any questions, any comments, I'd love to talk with you after the break. Uh, I unfortunately will have to leave before the wonderful award is voted on. Uh, but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emory and Alicia. I hope you're all very awake and fired up. Uh, next we'll have Ina Kaleva talking very soon. We're trying to fix the computer, uh, but it's going to work. I'm that means sure. I had more time. We think so. Who wants to talk about data breaches some more? Any other questions? Slides are up. Yeah. Um, so, I can talk more about the, the trials and tribulations over uh, the break, but primarily the major approach that was changing in 2016 was that we realized that we were absolutely incapable of um, using the previous manual approach of um, literally opening up a tab, trying to copy you know, breach by breach from every single data breach source, and we switched to uh, scraping data. Um, and that presented a whole host of problems with normalization and extracting and presenting it uh, legibly. So we started to go through a number of different uh, teams of students and contractors and data scientists to assist with normalizing. Uh, the major change 
um, over the past year and a half, we worked with the Coleman Research Lab to do a normalization pass. Um, and in the past year, we have been uh, refining our AI scripts to help with uh, classifying the breaches and trying to extract information from the breach notification letters themselves, which previously had been basically unobtainium because of the, the challenge of, of reading through each breach letter. But certainly challenges, and um, I hope that it is a, a helpful tool for your educational materials. And if you have any comments, please let me know. Thank you so much, Emory.